Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. This is what you will hear on today's program. Brian Lin has a report on a Chinese spacecraft that has brought moon rocks back to Earth. Then Jill Robbins has a story about neighbors who are in big trouble in the state of Maine. Katie Weaver reports on the effects of university closures in the U.S. We wrap things up with a special guest on Lesson of the Day with Jill and Andrew Smith. So, let's get started. A Chinese spacecraft has returned to Earth with rock and soil samples recently collected from the moon. A parachute Tuesday floated the unmanned Chengdu 6 capsule back to Earth in China's Inner Mongolia area. The return flight came after Chinese space officials announced earlier this month that the spacecraft had successfully gathered the samples and stored them for the trip. I now declare that the Chengdu 6 lunar exploration mission achieved complete success, said Zhang Kujiang, the director of China's National Space Administration. Zhang spoke during a televised news conference after the landing. Chengdu 6 launched May 3rd and touched down on the lunar surface about one month later. The spacecraft landed in an area near the moon's south pole called the Aitken Basin. The area is known as the far side of the moon because it always faces away from Earth. The successful return makes China the first country to ever collect and bring back lunar samples from the far side of the moon. In a statement, Chinese President Xi Jinping called the return a landmark achievement in his country's space development effort. The American space agency, NASA, describes the Aitken Basin as the largest impact basin on the moon. The area is believed to have formed more than four billion years ago. Chinese space officials said earlier that controllers on the ground had directed the space vehicle to use its drilling equipment and other tools to capture the soil and rock samples. The operation was expected to produce up to two kilograms of moon material. The samples will be closely examined by Chinese scientists. They said they expect them to include 2.5 million-year-old volcanic rock and other material. Scientists hope the samples will help answer questions about the differences between the moon's two different sides. It is not the first time a Chinese spacecraft has collected material from the lunar surface. The country's Chengdu 5 spacecraft traveled to the moon in late 2020. It successfully brought back about two kilograms of moon rocks and dust. That mission was carried out in an area known as Oceanus Procellarum. It sits on the western edge of the near side of the moon. That area is believed to have had intense volcanic activity in ancient times. China is the third nation to successfully collect lunar samples, following the United States and the Soviet Union. 
Before China's latest efforts, the last collection mission happened in 1976, when an unmanned Soviet spacecraft collected 170 grams of moon material. I'm Brian Lin. Common subject for British mystery stories is a death at a seaside community. But in the northeastern state of Maine, mysterious real deaths happened, although the victims were trees that blocked the view from a wealthy family's summer home. The story begins with a home kept by Amelia Bond, former chief of the St. Louis Foundation, and Arthur Bond the Third, an architect. Their summer home is on a hill that looks out onto Camden Harbor, part of Penobscot Bay, Maine. Amelia Bond brought a powerful chemical that kills plants, an herbicide, from Missouri in 2021. She placed it near tall trees on the waterfront property of Lisa Gorman. Gorman's home is downhill from the Bonds' home. To make matters worse. The chemical began to spread into a neighboring park, and the town's only public seaside beach. The highest level of law enforcement for the state is now investigating. Paul Hodgson is a resident of Camden who, like his neighbors, feels angry about the event. Anybody dumb enough to poison trees right next to the ocean should be prosecuted, as far as I'm concerned," he said. When the trees and other plant life began dying, Amelia Bond told Gorman in June 2022 that the trees did not look good, and offered to share the cost of removing them. Gorman's lawyer wrote in a document. Instead, Gorman had the trees tested. Soon, she called on lawyers to take action. The Bonds have paid more than 1.7 million dollars in fines. And payments to the town and neighbors. The trees are now gone, and the harbor view from the Bonds' home is improved. Bond used a chemical named tubethyrin. It stays in the soil for a long time, where it continues to kill plants. Scott McElroy is an Auburn University professor, specializing in weed science and herbicide chemistry. He said. It could take six months to two years for rain to dilute the chemical, so it no longer endangers plants. Tom Hedstrom is a local government leader in Maine. Wealth and power don't always go hand in hand with intelligence, education, and morals, he said. This was atrocious and gross, and any other word you want to use to describe abhorrent behavior. The bonds have paid a price for their actions, which they admitted in legal agreements. The money they paid included fees for testing damage to the environment, and for using an herbicide illegally. They also paid more than 1.5 million dollars to Gorman in a legal settlement. Hodgson said, "It is not just wealthy summer visitors who break the rules." He said. Some residents in the community have been known to cut down trees, knowing that it is illegal. They just pay the fine because they have plenty of money, Hodgson said. That's the town we live in. I'm Jill Robbins. City closures in the United States in recent years have left tens of thousands of students 
unsure about their education. Some face increased risk of never finishing their degrees at all. And the closures continue as schools around the country react to sharp drops in enrollment or registration of students since 2020. Nationwide, private colleges have been closing at a rate of about two per month, says the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. The organization recently released a study with the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center. It reported that 467 colleges, including for-profit and non-profit, have closed in the U.S. since 2020. The closings affected more than 143,000 students. Over two-thirds of the affected students received little warning and did not receive any support to continue their education elsewhere. Recently, students at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, received news that their school would shut down within days. Many students are not sure what they will do next. Katherine Anderson came from the American state of Texas to attend the school, also known as UArts, last year. She chose a program that she could not find anywhere else, combining the music business, entrepreneurship, and technology. The closure of U Arts has left her and 1,300 other students scrambling to find somewhere to go or something to do. By the time the school announced its closure, many colleges had already completed their admissions for the fall. Anderson was accepted into the music industry program at nearby Drexel University. She told the Associated Press that it was not a perfect match, but the next best thing, I guess. Because of all that's going on, I felt very pressured to make a decision as fast as possible, Anderson said. She is now seeking legal action against the University of the Arts. Before its closing, U Arts had trained musicians, artists, dancers, and designers in Philadelphia for nearly 150 years. The school had suffered a sharp drop in enrollment and said it was faced with significant, unanticipated expenses that forced its closure. State and local agents are investigating to find out exactly what happened. Lynette Kuhn is a top official in the Pennsylvania Department of Education. She said, We have yet to receive the answer to that question. In an online information event for University of the Arts parents and students. Heather Perfetti is president of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, an accrediting agency. She said at the same event, We all believe that no academic journey should include this kind of severe and abrupt disruption. Adam Machado came to UArts from New York's Hudson Valley. He received a $32,000 a year scholarship to study music. He is unsure if he would receive the same financial or training support from other schools. Machado has been performing in New York and Philadelphia with a band called Kids That Fly. 
He added that he is sad not only for himself, but one thousand other artists who are without a home. Cyrus Nasib, like many classmates who went through the admission process just a year ago, is not sure what he will do next. You don't really know where to start, he said. It kind of just saps your motivation to do anything. The study also said as many as half of students affected by school closings did not return. The numbers include students at nonprofit and for profit schools, including two year colleges. University of the Arts film major Ian Callahan Kenna did not like how the closure was carried out. He said the school acted like everything was normal and then shut down just two weeks later. It's just very, very upsetting, he said. I'm Katie Weaver. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. And now, the lesson of the day. And my name is Andrew Smith. My name is Jill Robbins. You're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our video series, Let's Learn English. This series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. We've reached the end of level one of the series, lesson 52. And to celebrate with us, we have invited the star of the series, Anna Mateo, to join us in our podcast. Thanks for talking with us today, Anna. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jill, for asking me. Although I would not call myself the star, this product was definitely a team effort. I was, however, the host, writer, producer, and director. You know, it takes many different roles to make these products. And another team of people made lesson plans and additional pronunciation videos. But I know you guys understand all this. Your podcast involves many roles, too. It makes the process more fun, and it goes quickly. Don't you think? It sure does. Time flies when you're having fun. And boy, did we ever have fun making this series. Is that how you look back on it, Anna? I do, but it was a lot of work, too. We had a great team. Almost everyone on the Learning English staff appeared in the videos at one time or another. And I must give a big shout out to Rick Heinemann, the videographer and video editor. He understood my writing and my humor exactly, so he was able to bring the scripts alive from page to the video. So thank you, Rick. Anna, I heard you produced one lesson a week for over a year. Can you describe a bit about uh, that process and what did you enjoy the most? Sure. It was actually almost two years, and during production, we were all doing our usual jobs of writing, voicing, and hosting other shows. For me, the most fun was writing funny scenes and acting with my amazing co workers Ashley, Kelly, Katie, Pete, Jonathan, Lucia, Dan, John Russell, Alice Bryant, and others. So wonderful. Taping our videos on location throughout DC was also fun, but could be stressful. 
As a producer, I had to line up locations and get permission. And I also want to thank Haido, our branch chief, for the freedom to do the series in the first place. Yeah, we went all over the city.、Uh, we filmed in museums, parks, and even private homes. Anna, since you're here, we'd like you to help us with this last lesson from level one. As you may know, we usually play a clip from the lesson and then talk about it. Would you mind introducing lesson 52 for our listeners? Sure. In the final lesson of level one, you see that I'm being interviewed on a special television program. The host of the show is Kelly, who you saw as the director in lesson 40 The Woods Are Alive. Kelly was such a wonderful co worker and on air talent. She no longer works at learning English, but stays in touch with many of us. So, in the beginning of this episode, Kelly introduces me to the audience and tells them about my new career in acting. Let's listen. Hello, it's Anna. I did it. Washington, D.C. is my home. Looking back over the past year, I've done so many amazing things. I have met people from all over the world. I've made many good friends. And I have a great job. And I've taken a lot of chances. And now I have some really big news. Wait for it. And three, two, one. Welcome to Around the Corner and Across the Street from the Actors Studio. Many people dream of becoming actors, but very often those dreams don't come true. Well, today we will meet a woman. And her acting career has really taken off. In fact, she acted in my play, The Woods Are Alive. Oh, she really brought the part of tree number 15 to life. Let's give a warm welcome to Anna Mateo. Thank you. There's a phrasal verb in here. Kelly says your career has really taken off. She means that you are making progress quickly. Like when an airplane leaves the ground, we say it is taking off. Right. And this lesson is all about taking chances and following your dreams. For example, in lesson 40, I took a chance on acting, and it had a great result. You will hear about how my acting career took off in the final lesson. And if our listeners watch Lesson 52, they will see that Anna is dressed in her tree costume, which we also saw in Lesson 40. Anna, can you tell us about this tree costume? Andrew? I still have parts of that tree costume. I love it so much. I made the tree costume out of cardboard and I made it so that it would be difficult to move in. I could not bend my knees, I could not bend my arms, I could not move. So I felt like a tree. Yeah, let's listen as Kelly asks about the costume and your future plans. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it is great to see you again, Director Kelly. It's great to see you too, Anna. I see you are still wearing your tree costume. Does this have anything to do with your big news? Yes. Yes, it does. Well, Anna, please share that news with us. Kelly, I will be acting. In three movies. That is amazing. Anna, tell us more. 
Well, the first is a science fiction movie. The second is a romantic comedy. And the third is an action movie. That is so great. <laughs> Let me guess. You're playing a tree in all of them. Yes. This is what happened. To prepare for your play, I had to find out what it was like to be a tree in the world. I had to find out where to eat, where to shop, where to meet people, and how to get around the city. And that's why we see you walking in your tree costume on the street in Washington, D.C. <laughs> there are a lot of people on the sidewalk watching you. The scene that really makes me laugh is when you say, where to meet people, and you hug a tree. I loved taping that scene. You know, props are special objects that you use in acting or in a scene, and also costumes can lead to funny situations. For this video, I told the videographer, Rick, to just follow me around. I knew that every action was going to be difficult and therefore funny. Again, I took the chance of being laughed at and it was well worth it. Amazing! I think big things are going to happen for you, Anna. <laughs> so tell me, will you be moving to Hollywood for a career in movies? No. I'll make the movies and then come back. Washington, D.C. is my home. <laughs> I'm sure your family is very proud. Yes, they are. You know, Kelly, not too long ago, I didn't feel very good about my life. I had to make a change. So I took some chances. Sometimes I succeeded. Sometimes I failed. But I will never stop trying. Thank you for sharing your news. And so much more with us, Anna. Until next time. From this last part we heard, I think the lesson is to keep trying. The only way to succeed is to take chances. That's right, Andrew. Taking chances and risks, making mistakes, failing. In every episode, from the very beginning, I wanted that to be a theme of the show. So in the show, I always make a mistake. Something always goes wrong. But in the end, it turns out okay. And this is important for language learners. Learning a language is not easy. So you have to take risks to learn. I want English learners who watch our programs to feel free to make mistakes. Well, they say you often learn best by making mistakes. So, listeners, why not try speaking English and see if people understand you? Anna, thank you so much for coming on our podcast and sharing with our listeners. Anytime, Andrew. Maybe we can do this again when you finish Level 2. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. We'll be in touch. Back to our listeners. We've been asking Anna a lot of questions. Now it's your turn. Do you have a question for Anna? You can email us at learningenglish at voanews.com or put your comments on our YouTube video for this podcast. And it'll be great if you share the lesson of the day with your friends and family. Remember that you can also find us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Thanks for listening. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. 
And I'm Mario Ritter.